as a speaker, every once in a while, you get to do really interesting things and go interesting places. One time I got a telephone call from Alaska, and the telephone call went something like this. We know you, that we would like to have you come and speak. We know you speak on leadership. We want to hear about that. We'll pay for your airplane ticket. We'll pay for your hotel. We'll pay for your meals. We'll give you an honorarium. We also know you're married, so we'd like to pay for your wife's airplane ticket so she can come with you. And we would also like to pay for three extra days for the two of you to tour around our state. This is how I knew it was the Lord's will for me to go to Alaska. <laughs> It was actually during the Iditarod, which that year was a 1,092-mile sled dog race from Anchorage to Nome, Alaska, and I got ringside seats. I went to the race headquarters, followed the progress of the race, got all the books about the Iditarod, talked to past champions, saw how they trained the dogs and all of that, but of course there's only one experience I really wanted, and you can imagine what it was. I wanted to be that guy right there having those dogs pull me. So. I found a man named William who lived in the wilderness near Fairbanks, Alaska. He had 25 sled dogs as a hobby. And he decided he would take me on a sled dog expedition. So we went out to his home. He took the sled outside, set it up so he could begin harnessing dogs. Well, the dogs saw the sled and they went berserk. They began to bark, howl, growl. They did everything they could think of to do to get William's attention. It was bizarre. I don't even know how to compare it to anything in human behavior other than maybe imagine a class of second grade boys, all diagnosed ADHD, <laughs> jacked up on Mountain Dew, <laughs> having been asked the question, for $200, what is two plus two? Okay, you can imagine the ensuing chaos that would take place in that room as the boys fought to be the one who could answer that question. That's kind of what it was like. I mean, these dogs were really excited about pulling the sled. Well, he pulled dogs off the picket line and harnessed them. And I, as, every, as he pulled the dogs off the picket line, I noticed one dog in particular became absolutely frantic. She was foaming at the mouth. She was doing everything she could do to get William's attention. Finally, she ran back along the picket line, bolted toward him as fast as she could go, hit the end of the picket line so hard she flipped upside down, scrambled back to her feet, and did it again and again. So I went over and tapped William on the shoulder. I said, William, I think that dog would like to go with us. <laughs> he looked and said, ah, she can't go. She's injured. I said, yeah, I could see how she might injure herself. <laughs> but we were no more than a mile down the trail when we heard a barking sound. We stopped the sled. Here she came running down the trail after us as fast as she could go, dragging her chain the picket line, the anchor behind her. She was not to be left behind. Her demeanor was so satisfied and happy. It was as if she were saying, I'm sorry I was held up, guys, but I'm here now. Let's party. So we added her on, and off we went down the trail. In spite of the chaos of the dogs seeing that we were going to pull the sled and wanting to be a part of the excitement of it, in spite of that, when they were harnessed and under William's control, they were very focused. In fact, I noticed that when William gave commands to them, he did not yell at them like they do in the sled dog movies. He whispered the commands and they obeyed. So we got back to William's house after this expedition was over. I said, William, do you mind if I ask some questions while you're putting the dogs back on the picket line? while you're rebuilding the picket line. <laughs> he said, sure, ask away. I, I said, well, I noticed that when you gave commands to the dogs, you did not yell at them like they do in the sled dog movies. He said, that's right. I said, in fact, I noticed that you whispered commands to the dogs. He said, that's right. I said, but they obeyed you. He said, yes. I said, well, we have a dog that lives at our house. <laughs> Um, I mean, he's a nice dog, but if you want him to do something, you have to yell at him. So how did you do that? William said something to me that not only helped me understand sled dogs, it shaped my whole understanding of what it means to live with purpose. He said, these dogs were made for this. They live for this. And when you are doing what you are designed to do, your master can guide you with a whisper. You catch that? When you're doing what you're designed to do, your master can guide you with a whisper. 
I thought about that long and hard. I realized I live in a culture that is constantly yelling at me. Everything is trying to get my attention all of the time. Billboards try to get our attention. T-shirts try to get our attention. Radio advertisements try to get our attention. Television advertisements try to get our attention. And every single one of those advertisements has at its core the, this philosophy. Your life is incomplete. You miss only one piece. And that is the piece that we have to provide to you. Whether it is a diamond set of earrings, or whether it is a new car, or whether it is a better shampoo. Your life will be better if you will buy the things we have for you. So very often, people get to the point where they think, I guess, then purpose in life, meaning in life, has to do mostly with the capacity to buy things that will complete your life. And so the goal in life must be to make as much money as you possibly can because that's what will complete you. As I think about that, I realize how many people have fallen for that idea and are doing things that make them utterly miserable vocationally because they believe that satisfaction in life will come from their purchasing power rather than from the design that God has given to them. So it's no accident that your generation is the first generation I'm aware of in all of history whose primary identification is as consumers rather than as producers. Most of your friends don't see their value in terms of what they can do to contribute. They see their value based on what they can get based on what they have. They either have popularity or they have good looks or they have money or a combination of those. Those things allow them to become the object of attention and that will bring satisfaction in life. But guess what? It doesn't bring satisfaction in life. The studies on this are pretty astounding. William Damon, in his book, Path to Purpose, says only about one in five young people ages 12 to 22 express a clear vision of where they want to go, what they want to accomplish in life, and why. In fact, young people who lack a sense of purpose, according to Damon's research, report an inner life of anxiety. They feel disappointed in themselves. They feel discouraged by what life has offered, and they despair at the emptiness of daily activities. Four out of five people are in that situation. Four out of five people live lives of anxiety and disappointment and discouragement and despair. What would it be like to be otherwise? Damon found that the people with purpose, the one out of the five, have the following characteristics. They are filled with joy despite sacrifices they must make. They have a sense of energy. They experience satisfaction when they accomplish their goals. They display persistence when they run into obstacles. In short, they are the sled dogs. Whether the work is hard or easy matters not to them. They operate in such a way that all of their activities return energy to them and make them feel more alive. And I started wondering that day in Alaska, why can't we get that? What will it take for us to reclaim that idea? Do you see what I'm getting at? Because it seems to come naturally to dogs, right? It comes naturally to animals. And animals just do what they do. Dog breeds are especially fun to watch because dog breeds tend to, you just see it, the puppy is born and the puppy just does whatever that dog breed does. When I got out of college, I had a roommate. My roommate got a Border Collie. Has anybody had a Border Collie? Border Collies, have you had a Border Collie? Are they not the freakiest dogs ever? They look you right in the eye and from the time they are puppies until the time they die, they herd everything. <laughs> they cannot not herd things. This dog is a puppy. We would sit in the living room. She would lay down in the doorway to guard us and made sure we stayed. If one of us got up and left the room, she'd follow along. He left the herd. <laughs> and out she would follow along. One time I left the room. I got on my mountain bike. I rode all the way down the trail. She followed me all the way down the trail and all the way back. She must have been exhausted running that far. When we got back, I sat down in the living room. She collapsed in the doorway as if to say, okay, now stay. <laughs> you could not take this dog up Pike's Peak. I tried to take her up Pike's Peak. I thought she would be a good hiking dog. She's fine as long as everybody's going the same direction she's going. <laughs> if they're going down and she's going up to her, they're going the wrong way. She has to corral them. 
no matter what sort of creature they are. One guy was running down the trail wearing his little neon shorts and his little running shirt, and he's running by, and I just see the dog trotting up. She's got her head hung down. She's paying no attention. At the last possible second when he runs by, she turns around and nipped him right in the heel. He stopped, dude, your dog bit me. I said, I'm sorry, you're going the wrong direction. She can't help it. He did not find that amusing. <laughs> but this dog could not not herd things. These sled dogs cannot not pull the sled. And I'm, I'm butchering the English on purpose to sort of make a point that the question is not just that we in life find something that we can do and we do it. We want to find that thing, that, that source of the way of operating, even if we're doing different kinds of jobs, but that way of operating that returns energy to us and makes us feel more alive. So at Summit of the Evening Times, we focus on vision topics. And tonight, I'd like for you to begin getting a vision of how you might answer that question, what does God want for me? What is His purpose for my life? And I think some of the things I'm going to share with you tonight probably are things you've not heard before. They might be things that even challenge some of the ideas that you've come to believe. I'm not asking you to believe these things just because I say them. I'm asking you to seriously consider them because Practically every person asks that question. What does God want from me? What am I supposed to do with my life? Does, it make sense to you? does this make sense to you so far? So here are three points I'd like to make tonight. It's very simple, very straightforward. You've got them in your PowerPoint slides there. If you are taking notes and you, on a different piece of paper, leave a little bit of space in between each one so we can fill in with some observations. But I think there are essentially three questions in life purpose. There is a who question, a what question, and a how question. A who question, a what question, and a how question.